Uh, you guys did your first mock draft, and of course you yep. went first, and yet you settled on, and again, there were no trades allowed, so obviously the Bears no. will be looking to trade, but you settled on Jalen Carter. Uh, can you explain why he would be the right guy for the Bears if indeed they don't trade down, or maybe even with a trade down, Rick? Well, what I was going to do is take a quarterback there just to stir the uh, pot a little bit. <laughs> oh, my. That's like the first one. Let's not come out the gate so strong right off the bat. <laughs> so, but the reason I, I, I went with Carter over Anderson is I know the depth. Uh, there's a lot of good players uh, that are pass rushers, and I'll be down at the Senior Bowl, and, and there's, there's a really good group of senior rushers down there, plus the juniors coming out, where – it's always been difficult for teams to find that inside dominant player. And if you can get a guy like a Jalen Carter that is not only a, a physical beast against the run, but he's such a unique athlete in how he can get some pressure on the inside. Because when you're watching these games, if you have two good edge rushers, but the quarterback able to step up in the pocket like the Brady's of the world, and you don't have pressure in his face, uh, then they're going to just pick you apart like a seven-on-seven seven drill. But when you can generate pressure on the outside and you can generate especially a game-changer on the inside, uh, usually great defenses have one of those type of defensive tackles, and I think Jalen Carter fits that. Rick, it's so early in the process. Can you help us understand the timetable of what to expect moving forward? Ryan Poles obviously has that what number one overall pick. There's such value in that that there's this expectation that if you're in the bear situation, you do want to trade down. You do want to maximize the value of that by getting maybe multiple picks and plan for the future, but also help your roster in 2023. When will these conversations start to take place and how much pressure do you think Ryan Poles feels to maximize the value of that pick? Well, during my uh, career, I've traded up and down a lot. In fact, uh, a lot of the Vikings fans thought that I would trade my uh, mother for a seventh round pick if I could. So, <laughs> and my mother was very offended by that, but that's fine. But uh, there's not a lot going on right now. Teams are right now game planning on how they're going to improve their roster. Whether first you have to evaluate your own roster, then you'll go into the free agent. What's free agency going to look like? What's the strengths of the positions in free agency, and then the draft. So you're kind of putting this game plan together over the next month or so. The initial talks, to be honest with you, usually start at the combine because if there's going to be a trade, especially with a player, that's where a lot of those deals will initially uh, get started. The draft stuff may linger uh, because I would hold on to it as long as I can. And the reason I say that is with Houston and Indianapolis in the same division, both needing a franchise quarterback, it'll be interesting to see how Ryan Poles plays this out and can are you able to, to uh, play one against the other, uh, especially at division rivals, and especially both teams needing a franchise quarterback. So I wouldn't expect anything from a trade just draft to move down or up, uh, you know, until near the draft or actually when they're on the clock or right before they go on the clock. He's Rick Spielman joining us on the Signature Bank Score Hotline, Signature Bank, making commercial banking personal. And, Rick, you're a great man to talk to because the Bears obviously just uh, got themselves a new team president, um, Kevin Warren, who you know well from uh, the years in Minnesota. What did you think when the Bears hired him? And, uh, and, and how, you know, how important is that job in the NFL? Yeah, no, I thought it was a great hire. And for Chicago to go out and be able to land a Kevin Warren uh, with all his vast experience, not only in the NFL, but you, you just hired uh, a Big Ten commissioner and maybe one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, uh, top conferences in the country. And what he was able to accomplish there uh, and how the TV deals he got for the Big Ten and, and uh, bringing in the uh, – USC and UCLA, but what they're getting is they're getting a really strong leader. He's a guy that uh, works extremely hard, excellent communication skills. He has that aura about him that people that are around him want to follow him. And he's a great listener because I know there's going to be a lot of things going on with the potential of a new stadium 
and he was phenomenal leading our organization uh, when we built the new stadium in downtown Minneapolis and actually uh, was a, was led the uh, way on the uh, new practice facility that we had. But working with Kevin, he understands. He, I've always ran the football side. He's always ran the business side. But to work with him hand in hand, I, I learned a lot about the business side. Um, you know, if I had any questions on the football side that I wanted to get an outside perspective from the football operation side of things, he was a great person to bounce that off of. So I think he's going to be a, a I thought it was just a phenomenal hire for the Chicago Bears. Rick, you understand the dynamic at Hallis Hall from having worked there and certainly your experience in Minnesota. And here, as you can imagine, understanding Chicago as you do, the conversation shifts to Ryan Poles reporting to Kevin Warren and wondering where that line is between, you know, separating the business and the football and can a, a team president be involved in football matters? Should he be and what role he could play? If you're Ryan Poles, how much do you welcome that uh, involvement? How much do you resist it? Well, I, I would be a total uh, open arms welcoming him that because of the vast experience that Kevin Warren does have. But, I think that when you're in a building, it's not a business side, it's not a football side, it's an entire organization that co needs to come together. And I remember Kevin uh, getting me involved in some of the business side when I worked with him and, and making sure that whether you're directly or indirectly involved with that football team, everybody in that organization has a part on that product which goes on the field on Sundays. And for example, you know, being and working through with Kevin and seeing how his people skills and how he he uh, embraced everybody. I learned, for example, the lady, that's the receptionist uh, that is answering the calls uh, from fans, well, that's the voice of the organization. And her job is extremely important, although she may be just a receptionist. Mm -hmm. So, but when, she, when pe the fans call her and how her attitude is towards those fans, because there could be a lot of angry fans at times, uh, that's the representation that person uh, gets from talking to that receptionist. So that is critical. And even though every piece of that organization, like I said, whether directly or indirectly, will have a piece of what that product looks like on the field. I talked to our people that are Vikings Entertainment Network. Uh, and how important that atmosphere was to create that home field advantage for us, uh, you know, in U.S. Bank Stadium, and what an incredible job they did. Well, if they can get the fans riled up, it gets the players riled up, and it gives us a home field advantage. So they didn't actually make the game plan. They didn't actually select the players, but that atmosphere and environment they created was a critical piece of us having such a good home record. So I think Kevin – and if you embrace that in Chicago, it's one organization. It's not two separate entities. And usually most of the franchises that embrace that theory, in my opinion, uh, have the best chance for success, both on the business and football side. Let's let's cut to the chase, Rick. How often did he tell you who to draft? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Kevin understands the business, you know, and he's never going to come in and say draft this or, hey, do that. Kevin's approach uh, when we worked together and both of us were reported directly to the ownership, but it, you know, Kevin's was, well, it's our responsibility to go up there, out there, sell tickets, marketing, whatever we do to bring money into the organization. And basically my job was what they were bringing in, we'd go out and spend. So, um, but that's, I think that's how everything should work. But Kevin understands the boundaries. He knows his strength. He's there. Uh, because he worked with Dick Vermeil, you know, he's he's worked right. with the Lions, he's worked with, so he's seen it all. And, you know, even when we had to work on things on the football side, whether it was contract related stuff with coaches or, or front office people, he was always there and we always had great dialogue and open conversation. So let's separate fact from fiction, uh, Rick. The 2021 draft, there were reports at the time that you were really compelled to move up to get Justin Fields. So, how compelled did, were you at that time, and what do the Bears have in Justin Fields? Oh, I, I, I can't remember that far back. That's why I'm retired down here in Florida <laughs> right now. <laughs> Sitting on my deck, it's the sun rising, and it's 75 degrees, but don't, let's not get into that. Um, 
watching Justin Fields, there's no – it's incredible the athlete that he is, and everybody's seen the ability on how he can make plays with his legs. And I think what Chicago did a great job of this year and Getze was especially, okay, if this isn't working, this offense isn't working for Justin Fields, we need to build an offensive scheme around what Justin Fields does well. And I think you saw that in the second half of the year and, and how well Justin played. I think he improved as a passer. I don't think you're ever going to see him just sit in a pocket and go through progressions like, okay, option one, option two, option three. That's not what his deal is. Um, but I think the more and more he plays, the more comfortable he's getting the game slowing down for him where he can get through those progressions quicker, but you're always going to have to design an offense that lets the defense know at any time this guy can hurt us with his legs. It, it's interesting when, when I think of that draft because it was Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. They, they were going to be the one-two guys. And then by the time you got to draft day, it was still the Trevor Lawrence draft, but Zach Wilson was the number two pick. And Trey Lance, they traded up, uh, obviously, famously, the – the uh, Niners did for him. And those were kind of, you know, almost like created players, right? And then it was uh, Fields and, and Mac. Um, when, you, when you think about how, you know, you're doing a podcast now on the draft. You've, you've done tons of drafts yourself. Why do guys get hot? Why do they move when it's maybe not on the tape? Is it the value of the position? Do people create players somehow? I think – People try, and, and I'll be the first to admit, I made some mistakes drafting quarterbacks uh, because you you have to have one. And sometimes where teams make mistakes or is that you see one thing and you've done all this tape work on film and you have an initial grade on them, then we go through all this pre-draft process, the psychological testing, the medical scores. You go probably to the pro day workout or if you have a private workout with the quarterback. And that will push especially that position up some if they're very impressive through that pre-draft process. What I've learned over the years is we always, once we had our initial grade on them, uh, what we saw them just as football players before we got all the other information that we needed, uh, that we would keep them in that same range on that board because we weren't going to let a workout affect our judgment mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, anything else. So. We would manipulate in that area of the board, but we would not say, okay, we have them in the third round, we're going to move them up to the first round. Or we have them in the first round, we're going to move them down into the fourth round. You kind of set your board and then you start manipulating it. And if you want to call it massaging it, or I will call it weaving, uh, weaving it together as you get all the other information that comes in. You know, I think people wonder in Chicago, Rick, how valuable that first overall pick truly is in terms of, the return the Bears could get. And I know every year might be different and everything might be about supply and demand and maybe where a team is moving from. But generally speaking, do you have a ballpark about what the Bears could get in return for that number one pick that Ryan Poles might auction off? You know, I think it's it's really has changed, but you can see the history. And I, I'm sorry I didn't go back and uh, do my studying on every uh, quarterback <laughs> that was – traded for in the first round of what those values are, but that's where you kind of get the initial baseline. What's different in this year's draft than there was in last year's draft. Last year, there wasn't a quarterback that was even rated probably in the top 10 or top 15. So Jacksonville was stuck with the number one overall pick. What's a huge advantage for Chicago is that you have some viable options at the most critical position on the roster uh, that are worthy of the number one pick. Are they Trevor Lawrence? You no, know, I don't think anyone's going to say right now that any of these guys are going to be Trevor Lawrence, but there are a lot of options out there. So when you have supply and you have demand, especially what we talked about earlier, the Houston Indy and even Carolina, because I know that owner and just reading from the, uh, the clips on the outside, they want to get that issue resolved because they kind of like were Indy where they'd just been flipping through uh, veterans with Baker Mayfield, with Sam Darnold. They want to get a young guy that that organization can grow with. So they may get overly aggressive to try to get up there and get one of these three. But it all depends, you know, on how teams end up with their final draft boards and how they see these quarterbacks. 
but at least Chicago is in a much better position than Jacksonville, Jacksonville was last year uh, because of the uh, maybe, I would say, supply of quarterbacks that could potentially be worthy of the first overall pick. Rick, we were having a conversation earlier in the program about, you know, the fact that Luke Getze is going to be coaching down at the uh, Senior Bowl and they've got some other assistants there. And just the idea that you can learn a little something about a guy, maybe how how uh, quickly he picks something up, whatever it might be in a week of practices. The one thing that kind of separates players in the NFL and really all major sports this idea, that, like, how much do you love what you're doing? How much do you love the game? What's your passion level? How much do you want to maximize your talent? And that has always been one of the great mysteries when it comes to drafting players because you see different guys and they've got an unbelievable work ethic and then you see other guys and you can see on tape that, you know, maybe they're too good for the level they're at and they're not pushing as hard as they should. How do you figure that out? What What is the process that you have to go through to figure out how much a guy is passionate about his job. Yeah, that's one of the things that we really put a point of emphasis on is because I don't care how much you pay a person. Like, Molly, if you didn't love the radio, you would probably wouldn't be as effective getting up every morning early to entertain your fans. Plus, they pay you a ton of money to do it, too, but that's <laughs> a whole nother subject. <laughs> if you got my tax returns again, Rick... <laughs> I got Molly's. It was, it, I mean, Jesus, public knowledge, how much he makes. Holy cow. <laughs> I got in the wrong business. I should have never got on the front office side of the NFL. <laughs> That's true. That's funny. But, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I think that's the, the one of the burning bush questions, and we tried to tackle that with the type of psychological testing that we did um, because, you know, you, you always are uh, maybe you're – red flag or your awareness goes up when all of a sudden a guy is underachieving to his physical ability and then all of a sudden the last year of his contract or his senior year, then he just balls out for some reason. Now, some of it's because of development. You know, I remember Joe Burrow didn't play as well uh, the year before he came out. Then when he came out, you know, he ended up being a, as good of a quarterback as you can get coming out of the draft. Uh, but, those are the things that you try to delve into with your resource, with your sources that you talk to, uh, with actually how you interview the player. Uh, I actually had special operations uh, forces come in that do that for a living. Wow. That I won't say in, interrogating, but trying to get the rehearsed answers that you're going to get from these players to really dive down deep and figure out what makes these players tick or why do they love football. And, and try to come up with those answers. Because every guy that I missed on uh, wasn't because of its physical talent. It was because when we looked at it, we put a U uh, right next to their uh, number grade. So we knew that he was an underachiever for where he should be playing. And that was a red flag for us. So that's when we start diving into those guys and the psychological testing and the interviews and things like that to determine whether this guy really, really wanted to to love football or he doesn't love football. Rick, quickly before we let you go, the Bears will be obviously looking to trade that pick, but they uh, there will be some conversations, maybe not at Hallis Hall, but some suggestion about they should trade Justin Fields or move on from Justin Fields and use that pick themselves for a quarterback. I don't think that's the way they go, but do the quarterbacks coming out look like they are potentially good enough or better than what the Bears have right now? Well, that's what you have to talk about internally. We know what Justin Fields is, and we saw we've been around him now for a year, so we know his work habits. We know his leadership skills. We know how the players feel about him. Uh, we know what he can and can't do, what his strengths and weaknesses are. If you decide to trade him, which I don't think they should, I think that would be a mistake, then you're starting over from scratch, and how do you know you got something better than Justin Fields? On paper, it may say that, but do you truly know? Uh, because you're still as much resources and energy and money that you're putting into the draft to try to get, it's still a subjective decision because you don't know until they're actually in the building and you're going through that process. So they know what they have in Justin Fields, and if they don't like Justin Fields or that's not part, then, yeah, I would trade him. But I don't think – I think he's too talented of a player 
And when you look at all these players, the, the two is of the world, the Hurst of the world, look at the jump they made from their second to third year, even go back to Josh Allen. And I expect that same type of jump uh, with Justin Fields.